So first of all, we need to understand what physics is. So before we start this course, like why should we study physics, right? So what we say is that the goal of physics is to gain a deeper understanding of the world in which we live. For example, when we use the laws of physics, we can predict the behavior of everything from rockets sent to the moon to integrated chips in computers to lasers, the lasers that we use to do LASIK eye surgery, and in short, everything in nature from atoms to subatomic particles to solar systems in bigger scales in galaxies. Everything follow the laws of physics. Before we even want to study physics, we need to develop a common language of physics. So once we know this language, then we can move forward and start understand, uh, understanding the laws of physics. If I want just to define physics in one sentence, I can say that physics this is the study of the fundamental laws of nature. Simply put, they are the laws that underlie all physical phenomena in the universe. What is noticeable here is that we have found that these laws can be expressed in terms of mathematical equations. Okay. So as a result, it is possible to make precise quantitative comparisons between the predictions of the theory derived from the mathematical form of the laws and the observations of experiments. Now, this is a good news because now we have something called mathematical equations to be able to express what we observe around us. Now, in this course, Fortunately, you're not going to need to use like a very, very heavy and big mathematical equations, but we need to use some. In order to make that common language that I was talking about, let's start with studying the units of length, mass, and time. So these are the certain basic physical quantities that we should be able to measure. First of all, let's go ahead and make them more short and easier to write. So let's just show length by L. We are going to show mass by M. And then we are going to show time by T. Okay, later in this um, text, Additional quantities such as temperature and electric current and magnetic field will be introduced. But as of now, let's just get familiar with length, mass, and time. Okay, so our unit of length is meter. So this is this I unit. So here we're not going to use inch or feet but we are going to use meter. This is the standard unit in physics. And let's just show it by lowercase m. Now, so if a person is 1.5 meters tall, the height is 1.5 times this unit of length. So for example, I am 1.72 meters tall. Okay, so the unit of mass is kilogram. Let's just write it here, kilogram, and we show it by kg. Okay, for example, and this is not easy to write here, but let's go ahead and do it. For example, I am 79 kilogram. I know, I need to lose some weight. And then the unit of time is second. So it's not minute, it's not hour. I know that these are the units that we use in daily life, but what we use in physics as a standard unit for time, and we are going to convert every other unit to these three, meter, kilogram, and second, okay? So for time, it is second, and let's just show it by S. 
So these standard units all together, we call them SI units. So this stands for System International, the unit, which was French at the beginning, but now everywhere we use it and we call it SI unit. The rest of this section is for yourself to study because it shows how the early units of Lent was associated with the human body, how we came up, and by we, we mean like scientists back then came up with the unit of mass and also and the same thing for time. So these are for you to study and then we'll have some questions about them in the discussion. In physics, when we speak of the dimension of a physical quantity, we refer to the type of quantity in question. So type of quantity in question, regardless of the units used in the measurement. So regardless of the units. Okay, for example, a distance measured in cubits and another distance measured in light years both have the same dimension. They both have this dimension of length. Okay, so for length, for example, the dimension could be cubits, it could be light years, it could be meters, right? So no matter what the unit is, still you have the dimension of the length. Okay, the same is true of compound units such as velocity. So velocity, here velocity, and let me write it here for you. So velocity has the dimension of length, length, by time or divided by time so the dimension is length per unit time now a velocity measured could be miles per hour right it could be what else inches per century huh even this, it can be meters per second. It can be kilometers per hour. So no matter what the units here are, it is still the dimension of velocity. Okay, now we know that what dimension is, let me to tell you that any valid formula, any valid formula in physics must be dimensionally consistent. So what does that mean? It means that each term in the equation must have the same dimension. It means that it doesn't make sense to add a distance to a time, for example, any more than it makes sense to add apples and oranges. They're different things. So you cannot add a distance to a time. You cannot add velocity to a time. So if you want to add things together, they should have the same dimension. Let's make an example here. Before we even want to do that example, let's introduce a special notation for the dimension of a quantity. So we'll use square brackets, this guy here, right here, for this purpose. So this is just to show that the quantity is a dimension. So when we put something in the square bracket, we're talking about the dimension. For example, if x represents distance, okay, the dimension of it is length right so we put it in the bracket square bracket so this this means that this is the dimension of length so dimension of length okay 
So we can write x has the dimension of length. Similarly, a velocity. So velocity v in this is velocity. So this has the dimension of length per time. So we can write that the dimension of velocity is length per time. Okay. So acceleration is another thing. And this is what we're going to talk about a lot as we move forward. But for now, acceleration has the velocity, has the, sorry, has the dimension of length per time, per time. Why? Because acceleration, which is A, is the change of velocity per time. And the velocity of itself is the change in distance per time. So a distance per time and a, a distance per time per time. So this has the dimension of length per time per time. Okay, so we can simply write this as length per time squared. Now I want you to take a look at table one five in your book and it gives you the dimensions of some common physical quantities. For example, distance has the dimension of L. So this is for distance. And then you have area, right? So area has the dimension of L squared. And then you have volume. So of course it should have the dimension of length cubic. And then we have velocity that we talked about. It has the dimension of length per time. And then you have acceleration, acceleration, which has the dimension of length per time squared. And then you have energy. So why don't I just let, let you study this yourself and then figure out how to write the dimension for energy. Okay, back to the example that we wanted to talk about. Take a look at this equation here. So let's use the notation that we, we learned to check the dimensional consistency of this simple equation. So this is like the, the, the basic equation of mechanical physics when we talk about the Newton's laws of motion, okay? It says x equals to x naught plus v times t, okay? So this naught, whenever we put it, we usually mean like the initial quantity. So here is the initial distance, okay? So here, x and x naught represent this distances. v is a velocity and t is time. So let's just write the dimensions of each term. So x has the dimension of length, then x naught has the dimension of length, plus v has the dimension of length per time times t has the dimension of time. Okay, so because both of these guys are the same, I can cancel them. So it becomes that length has the dimension of length plus dimension of length. This is correct, right? So each term in this formula has the same dimension, which is length. So this type of calculation with dimensions is referred to dimensional analysis. And this is like a very big tool for you to see if you have solved a problem correctly just by checking the dimensional 
analysis of the equation. Now, I know that this is not a typical equation that you see, and do not make uh, the mistake of thinking that the right side is 2L. This is not, you know, I just put like cross and cross because this is not what we are uh, getting from this equation. Because of this square bracket, the square bracket, so this means that this is just a dimensional check. It does not fo follow the, the typical mathematical equations, okay? So this says that if the left-hand side has the dimension of length, then anything on the right-hand side should have the dimension of the length after you cancel out all the similar terms. So it can be, for example, here, if it is length plus length plus length, then the other side should be everything should be plus or minus length okay so this is simply just a dimensional analysis now let's talk about exercise one two on your book which uh, which says show that x equals to x naught plus v naught t plus half a t squared is dimensionally consistent. All right, so this is another equation that we'll talk about in chapter two or three. So the equations here, the equation here has x and x naught, which are distances. It has v naught, that is a velocity, and it has a, that is an acceleration. So what I'm going to do here, and I want you to follow step by step, is that I'm going to write down the dimensions. So on the left-hand side, you have x with the dimension of length, so L equals 2. You have x naught, again, dimension of length, plus, so v naught is the initial velocity, and we know that it has the dimension of length per time and then you have times t which has the dimension of time plus okay and then you have half a t squared the half does not have any dimension right because it's just a number so leave it out then you have acceleration that has the dimension of length per t squared times then you have time squared so yields to the dimension of t squared now let's see what happens here these two guys cancel these two guys cancel so left hand side is l right hand side is l plus l plus l so everything on both sides is the dimension of length so this is checked so this means that the analysis that we made showed that the, the dimension is consistent in this, is in this equation. So I'm using the correct equation. So remember that we talked about that we need to make a common language before we even want to study physics. So this is another thing that we need to, to know. It's called significant figures. When a length, a mass, or a time is measured in a scientific experiment, the result is known only to within a certain accuracy. So the inaccuracy or uncertainty can be caused by a number of factors. Okay, So this could be from limitations of the measuring device itself to the limitations associated with the senses and the skill of the person performing the experiment. Now in any case, the fact that observed values of experimental quantities have inherent uncertainties should always be kept in mind when we are calculating with these values. So what we use here, or the tool that we use here um, to decide on the level of uncertainty in a numerical value is indicated by the number of significant Figures, so what we call sig figs. So in short, we call this sig figs, just to be short. 
The number of significant figures in a physical quantity is equal to the number of digits in it that are known with certainty. Example, suppose that you want to measure the walking speed of your pet, okay? To do so, you measure the time, the time that it takes for the pet to walk a distance D. And then you calculate the velocity. Velocity is distance per time. Now, when you measure the distance with a ruler, so you find that D is 21.4 centimeters. Now, each of these three digits is known with certainty. So we have that this, we say that this has three sig figs, right? Two, one, and four. We know them with certainty. Now, the digit that follows the four is uncertain. So that is why it has three sig figs. Now, if you measure the time with an, like a, a pocket watch, and then you understand that T is 8.5 seconds. Now, help me here. How many sig figs does this time has? Because we know only two sig figs or two numbers by certainty, we can say that time has two significant figures. All right, so anything that follows the five is uncertain. Now, you want to measure the velocity, and then I know that velocity is d divided by time, so I can write 21.4 centimeters divided by 8.5 seconds. Now, if you calculate this with your calculator, you get a number to be 2.5176470 centimeters per second. Huh. So, Clearly, we cannot have such an accurate value for the speed because what we know from the distance is only three sig figs, and for time, we only have two sig figs. Then, how can the velocity has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight significant figures, right? So, this cannot be, of course, so we cannot include all the numbers here. So, what is the rule here? So we have a simple rule to determine the significant figures when multiplying or dividing two quantities. So this rule says that the number of significant figures after multiplication or division is equal to the number of significant figures in the least accurately known quantity. So what you take is the least accurate known quantity. So here, for example, in our example, the least accurately known is time because it only has two sig figs. So we have to choose only two significant figures for the measurement of velocity. So I'm going to only take 2.5 here. So I can write velocity equals to 2.5 centimeters per second. So anything after 5 here, it is not accurate because there is no way that with only having 2 or 3 significant figures for the initial quantity, we know up to 8 significant figures after the measurement. While I let you read on your own the example 1.3 uh, one and following by the explanation, about the um, finding of the significant figures when adding or subtracting up to the round of error, no, actually read the round of error, up to converting units, which is section 1.5. So this is converting units. So everything, <clears throat> excuse me, everything from example 1.3 until section 1.5 is for yourself to study. Okay, now let's talk about converting units, which is, I think, the most um, commonly used um, stuff in Physics 1. 
for example, <clears throat> if you want to convert 316 feet to its equivalent in meters. So first of all, you need to look at the conversion factors on the inside front cover of your textbook. So let me just go back and then if you go to like exactly the inside of the front cover of your textbook, you can see the conversion factors. So for uh, after looking at that, you see that one meters equals to 3.281 feet. Okay, so if one meter is equal to 3.281 feet, I can write that one meter divided by 3.281 feet equals to one, right? So I simply just manipulate the equation. So now to make the conversion, we simply multiply 316 feet by this expression. So which is basically equivalent to multiplying it by 1. So if I multiply 316 feet by this expression, which is actually 1, so 1 meter divided by 3.281 feet, so I get 96.3 for the number. I look at what happens. Remember that dimensional analysis, so the feet cancels out, so it becomes 96.3 meters. So I could convert the feet to meters. So we write the conversion factor in this particular way as 1 meter divided by 3.281 feet so that the units of feet cancel out, leaving the final result in the desired unit of meters. And then of course we can just easily convert from meters to feet if we use the reciprocal of this conversion factor. So I can write that again, look at this. So I can write that 3.281 feet divided by 1 meter equals to 1, right? So it doesn't matter <clears throat> because it's 1. If you, uh, if you reciprocate it, it is still 1. So for example, if I have a distance of 26.4 meters, then I can just multiply 26.4 meters by this expression, which is 3.281 feet divided by one meter, so the meters cancel out, and then you multiply the numbers, you get 86.6 feet. So if you look at that table, and uh, um, the conversion factors on the inside front cover of the text, um, or you can just like even Google it, and if you just find this conversion factor, this is what is important. Then no matter if what expression you use, you can either write like one divided by three point two hundred eighty one or three point two hundred eighty one divided by one. So you should just like figure out how to write that expression so the quantities cancel out and you get your desired unit out of it. Okay, let's do an example here. This is example 1.6 on your book. It says the interior of a popular microwave oven has a width of 15.5 inches, a depth of 14.5 inches, and a height of 9.25 inches. 
What is the interior volume of the oven in SI unit? So remember that we showed volume by capital V. So what is it in SI unit? So volume in SI unit should be in meter cubic. So the first thing when you want to solve any physics problem is picture the problem. Just picture it. Either imagine it or sketch it. So let me just here sketch something. Eh, I'm not much of a sketcher, but let's see that this is my microwave. Seems better than I imagined. Okay, so the interior of the microwave only. So this is its width, right? This is its depth, and this is the the height of it. Okay, then you need the reasoning and strategy. So reasoning and strategy. We know that we want the unit of volume at the end in meters cubic, which is the SI unit. So we should begin by converting the width, the depth, and the height of the oven to meters. Now, once this is done, then the volume is just easy. It's simply the product of the three dimensions, right? Okay, so always in physics problems, we first write down the known of the problems and the unknown of the problems. So this is the known, and this is the unknown. Sorry, this is a bad read. Okay, now let's solve this. First of all, we need to convert the width of the oven to meters. Okay, so Okay, so I want to convert inches to the meters. Now I go back to the uh, back of the front cover of your book, and in that conversion factor, it says that one inch equals to 2.54 times 10 to the power of negative 2 meters. Okay, let me just quickly make a note here that 10 to the power of negative 2 means 0 0.01. Okay, so this is just like a scientific notation. All right, so I need to find an expression. Remember that I have 15.5 inches for the width, right? And whatever expression I use here, I want to get out a number in meters. Right. So if I want this inch here cancelled, the inches here should be in the denominator. So I need to find an expression. Sorry, maybe a little up. Okay. So that these inches can uh, can cancel out together. Okay. So now you know that the expression that should that we should write is going to be 2.54 times 10 to the power of negative 2 meters on top and then 1 inch in denominator so that the inches can cancel out. Now when I calculate this, on my calculator I get something like this. I get 339.37 times 10 to the power of negative 2 meters. Okay. So that I can write as 0 0.3937 meters, okay? But then again, back to the significant figures. So what I have on the initial value is only three significant figures for the width, okay? So this is way too much here. So at this 7, we cannot know with certainty. So what I can do is that I can just round this number, and because the 7 is more than 5, I can write it to be 0 0.394 meters. So if you have already um, read the, the, the reading part that I told you to read, like how to round off the error, 
So you should know how to round this number. Okay, so this was for the width. Now we are going to do the same for the depth and for the height. So in all of them, I can just use this expression here to convert the units. All right, so we calculate these very similar to what we did for the width, and then I get depth to be 0 0.368 meters and height to be 0 um, 235 meters. Now let's find the volume. So volume is simply the multiplication of width by depth by height. So I'm going to multiply 0 0.394 meters by three, sorry, 0 0.368 meters by 0 0.235 meters. Now you multiply all of them and then the number that you get is 0 0.0341 meter cube. Okay. Now, only three significant figures is allowed because the initial value for the width, the depth, and the height had only three significant figures. So that is right, one significant figure, two significant figures, and three sig figs. So this zero, because it is not after, but it's behind the numbers, it doesn't count as the significant figure, okay? Now, study, study, study. Now, what you need to do is that you need to solve problems and just practice, practice, practice. So just solving one equation or two equations would not help. But if you want to really um, like become expert in converting units, what you need to do is that you need to solve at least 10 problems on your own and check with the answer. If it is right, bravo. If it is not, see where you made a mistake and how you can improve it, okay? So, so hear it from me. I've been studying physics in like the past 20 years of my life. So in physics, solving the problems, becoming expert in it, even if you do not want to become expert, you just want to pass this course what you need to do is practice, practice, practice. So I cannot insist any more on this. So solve at least 10 problems and convert the units so that you become like, it becomes like easy for you. You know, it becomes like, you can even do it. After solving 10 problems, I... I promise that you don't even need to think about like how to find that expression anymore. It becomes rooted on your mind, okay? How and where to solve these problems? There are plenty of examples on your book. So you, can, you, you kind of like have the uh, quick example 1.7. Before that, you have another example. And then you can just search it. Use internet and search for the like just just use the keyword and just write down converting units in physics or problems of converting units. You, you will find like thousands of um, problems. What I'm gonna do is that I'm going to uh, post kind of like an example sheet for you or maybe an example video, whatever I find first, so they can just practice more. Another topic that we're going to talk about is scalars and vectors, and this is section 1.7. Now, physical quantities are sometimes defined solely in terms of a number and the corresponding unit, like, for example, the volume or the temperature. Um, but some other quantities require both a numerical value and a direction, for example. Imagine that your car is traveling at a rate of 25 meters per second in a direction that is due north. Now, both pieces of information here, the rate of travel and the direction is important equally here. They are required to be able to fully specify the motion of the car. Now, the rate of the travel 
is given the name speed. So speed is only the rate of travel. Okay, let's say here in our example that was 25 meters per second. Okay, now if this rate of travel combined with the direction, then we call it velocity. The velocity then is 25 meters per second due north. So it has both the number and then the direction. So then this, qual this quantity speed is called the scalar because it only has the value, but then the velocity is called a vector because it has both the value and the direction. Okay, so for example, a car can be only moving to the left or to the right, up or down, and so on. So that is only two choices are available for a direction of a vector in one dimension. So when we're talking about one dimension, then, for example, a, a person or a car or bicycle, whatever, so your object here can only move this way or that way. It can move this way or that way, right? Because it is one dimension that we are talking about. For example, if a car, this car, is moving to the right, so we can call that the velocity is positive 25 meters per second. So this plus sign indicates motion in the positive direction. So plus sign. If the car, however, is moving to the left, then I can write that V is negative 25 meters per second. Now, this minus sign indicates motion in the negative direction. So, negative direction negative direction. Okay, so in physics, in one dimension, we define this axis x. Okay, so anything that is going in the direction of the axis is positive, and if it is going in opposite direction to the left is negative. Okay, so the velocity of car one is positive 25 meters per second. The velocity of the car two is negative 25 meters per second. So because this negative and positive sign shows the direction, we can say that this velocity is a vector, right? But the speed of each car is the absolute value or just the magnitude. So the magnitude or just the magnitude, just the magnitude is the speed so it's not called velocity anymore so we can say that absolute value of v1 equals to absolute value of v2 equals to 25 meters per second so when i put these two lines here it means that i'm talking about just the magnitude so we don't care about direction anymore so this is called absolute value or just the magnitude And the last topic of this chapter that we're going to talk about is problem solving in physics. So there are some tips and each time that we have a problem from the next chapter on, I want you to just follow these tips. First of all, read the problem carefully. So before you can solve a problem, you need to know exactly what information it gives and what it asks you to determine. Some information is given explicitly. For example, if you have a problem states that a person has a mass of 70 kilograms, this is explicit. 
The other information might be implicit. For example, if it says that a ball is dropped from rest, means that its initial speed is zero. Okay, so a careful reading is essential in the first step of the problem solving. Next thing that I want you to do is that to sketch the system. So this may seem like a step you can skip, but don't. If you have like a very sharp imagination, feel free, but I still recommend you that even with a very good sense of imagination, always sketch the system. Now this sketching helps you to acquire a physical feeling for the system. Now it provides an opportunity to label those quantities that are known and those that are unknown. Next is visualize the physical process. Try to visualize what is happening in the system as if you were watching it in a movie. Now your sketch should help with this step. This step ties in closely with the next step, which is strategize. Okay. So this might be the most difficult step, but at the same, same time, it's the most creative part of the problem solving process. Now, from your sketch and visualization, try to identify the physical processes at work in the system. So you should ask yourself what concepts or principles are involved in this situation. Then develop a strategy, like a game plan for solving the problem. So this next step is identify appropriate equation or equations. Once you have a strategy how to solve the problem, then we need to find the specific equations that are needed to carry it out, right? And then after this step, everything is more clear and easy. Solve the equations. Solve the equations. Use basic algebra to solve the equations identified in the previous step. Now work with some symbols. Work with X, Y, T, V. So most of the part, you do not need to substitute the numerical values until the very end of the calculation. And this is what I insist in. The numbers here, the numbers are the last step, last step. So try to work with symbols as much as you can until the very last step. Try to work with X, V, Y, T, M, because it's just like easier. You do not need to think about the significant values and how to round this and that. And then always, always, always check your answer. Check your answer. Now, once you have your answer, check to see if it makes sense. Now, does it have the correct dimension? So, this is what we talked about dimension analysis, right? Does it make sense? Is the numerical value reasonable? Like, for example, if you just, like, find, like, a speed of a, um, a car is, like, let's say, like, 100 miles per um, nanosecond. Does it make sense? Can it be like that? Okay. And then last is to explore limits. and special cases. So getting the correct answer is nice, it's good, but it's not all there is to physics. You can learn a great deal about physics and about the connection between physics and math by checking various limits of your answer. For example, if you have two masses in your system, M1 and M2, what happens in the special case where M is zero? Or what happens if the two masses are equal? Now, what happens if one is bigger than the other one? Now, check to see whether your answer and your physical situation um, agree. 
Okay, so these are my suggestions. Now, not everywhere is, you know, like you have all this situation to deal with. You might like just have a, a, a um, problem which is like simply just a substitution of a number, but this is like the most general form. Now, what I want you to do for sure, I'm going to start them. So this is what you are required. If you do not do these steps, then you will lose, you will lose a score. Okay. So read the problem carefully. Of course, it's on your own. Sketch the system. When we are talking about mechanics, I want you to do this uh, step. Then visual the physical processes are on your own. Own strategize is your own. Identify appropriate equations is what you need because I need to see the appropriate equation written on your paper so that you get the score for that part. And then of course solve the equations. And I want you to do this. Like leave the numbers until the very last step and then check your answer and then explore limit or special case. Now under strategize and i'm gonna put a star here so this is something that will earn score for you is to write known and unknown of the problem okay for example you can use this notation known is x equal to three meters T equals to two seconds. Unknown is what is velocity. Now, as easy as this. So this will earn you score. And then another one that I will add here is to box your final answer always 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 write units this is physics guys in physics we love units you have no idea how much we love units so let me just sketch it for you so this is how the scoring will work you have a problem what i want to see on your paper is that you have a nice sketch here for example this okay and then you have labels for example x equals to positive three meters and then i want you to have the known as these are just example x three meters t two seconds and the unknown is what is velocity for example then i want you to have your equation for example and then i want you to have the let's say replacement and then your nice answer with unit and then box it let's say that this problem was find the velocity of car blah 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 okay if it has 10 points what kind of car is that looks like czar okay so it, if the problem has 10 points most probably and i'm not saying this is definite but most probably your sketch will be one point See, like easily, just by sketching and labeling, you can easily earn one or two points. Writing the known and not unknown of the problem most probably will have two points. See, even like if you do not know anything, just sketching and writing will earn you three points. And then putting this equation here, we have like another one point. So up to here, even if you do not know, see, like you have already earned four points, which is almost the half of the the uh, the point of the problem and then like this part will have 
let's say 0.334. Let's say this is another, the replacement is another point, like another two points. So now I have six, and then unit, of course, always have one point at least. So this is seven, and then your answer is three points. Okay. So this is just to give you an idea of how I'm going to grade things in this course. So again, look at this. If you own this sketch, if you just write the known and unknown of the problems, if you just identify which equation you're going to use, you have already earned four points out of ten. All right. So if you just miss to do this middle step or miss or you have like a wrong answer here, you're only going to use three to five points, right? But you at least have everything else correct. Okay, so this was all about lecture one of chapter one of your book. And I will write and post everything else that you need to know about this.